one of your victories of old, God, I pray that you would help us to, to put ourselves there, uh, to, to see ourselves in this place, God. And as we uh, come back to our, our present time, God, that you would take us from this place, uh, instructed and challenged and comforted by your word. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We started last week uh, what's a, an unofficial series, uh, three chapters about the prophet Elijah. Uh, we talked about last week that Elijah is one of the few people in the Bible that gets even a partial physical description. And it comes secondhand. It comes from 1 Kings chapter 1. Uh, Ahab has been looking for Elijah and he sends some people to uh, track him down and they run into a guy that they think is him. Ahab asked them, what did he look like? And they said he was very hairy and had a big leather belt on, possibly leather pants. And Ahab says, Elijah, that's him. Uh, and we talked about it last week. This is the Old Testament, so imagine how hairy you had to be for people to describe you as a hairy guy in the Old Testament. So I want you to picture, when you picture Elijah, make sure that you picture a very hairy man in leather pants. Uh, we talked about uh, last week where we are. We're dropping right in the middle of uh, the ongoing history of Israel and it helps to remember where we are and what's been going on. Remember, God called Abraham and said, through you I will make a great nation. Abraham had many descendants. Uh, Twelve tribes were descended from Abraham. They went to Egypt. They were enslaved there. But God delivered them from slavery, led them out of Egypt, led them through the wilderness, and eventually to the Promised Land. In the Promised Land they were ruled by judges and then kings, King Saul, King David, King Solomon, and then Solomon's son Rehoboam ruled the kingdom so badly that the kingdom split into two. There were ten tribes in the north that called themselves Israel and two tribes in the south that called themselves the kingdom of Judah. What we're looking at is in the, in the northern kingdom. This is about a hundred years after the split. And King Ahab has inherited the most successful period of the northern kingdom's history. His father, King Omri, expanded the kingdom, had a great military, a great economy, yet just like all the other kings of the northern kingdom, led the people into idolatry. But Ahab goes a step beyond that. Ahab makes what is politically a very smart move. He marries the princess of the kingdom to the north, the, the kingdom of uh, Sidon. Uh, her name is Jezebel. Perhaps you've heard of her. And Jezebel, as we talked about last week, is very religious. The problem is that she's not religious toward Yahweh, the God of Israel. She's religious toward Baal, the Canaanite God of fertility and the Canaanite God of thunder and of lightning. Uh, he is the rain god. He is the warrior god. And he has a goddess wife named Asherah. And part of the worship of Baal involved going to Baal's temple, which has been set up now, thanks to Ahab, in the capital city, Samaria, uh, and to participate in fertility rituals with temple prostitutes. So you can sort of see why God would not be uh, real uh, enthusiastic about his people not only worshiping someone else, but worshiping a god like Baal. Uh, and the people's hearts have been divided through Jezebel and through Ahab's wholehearted support of Baal worship. I've called this sermon the God Contest, and I want you to imagine it with me as a drama or as a movie in several parts. Uh, there are not many people who do movies like this anymore, uh, but there are some people who do movies where the movies have chapter titles. There's a particular section. Quentin Tarantino does this. And if Quentin Tarantino was going to make a chapter of a Bible into a movie, this would probably be the one. Uh, so imagine it, if you will, with black screen and white titles of the different chapters, uh, the different sections of, of chapter 18. So chapter 1, the Obadiah incident. Remember in chapter 17, Elijah has told Ahab, he shows up kind of out of nowhere, announces himself and says, it's not going to rain in Israel for three years. This hits Baal right where it hurts. This is Baal's job, is to make it rain. This is Baal's job, is to bring fertility to the land and fertility to the people. And so already there's a God contest been going on. Yahweh's prophet said, it's not going to rain. And it hasn't rained. <laughs> and we looked at last week that God provided for Elijah during this period of time. How he uh, kept him safe in the wilderness. How he led him to uh, outside of Israel, to uh, Jezebel's neighborhood. And had a widow take care of him there. And we looked at God's provision and how that made Elijah into a missionary. Uh, but now Elijah is coming back. The time has come for the contest to really uh, come to a head. And look at with me at 1 Kings. We'll read verses 1 through 16, and then we'll look back in a little more detail at this conversation. It came about after many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, third year of no rain, saying, Go show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the face of the earth. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. 
The famine was severe in Samaria. Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. That's Ahab's household. Now Obadiah feared the Lord, Yahweh, greatly. For it came about when Jezebel destroyed the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and provided them with bread and water. Ahab said to Obadiah, Go through the land to all the springs of water and to all the valleys. Maybe we'll find grass and keep the horses and mules alive and not have to kill some of the cattle. So they divided the land between them to survey it. Ahab went one way by himself. Obadiah went another way by himself. Now, as Obadiah was on the way, behold, Elijah met him. And he recognized him and fell on his face and said, Is this you, Elijah, my master? Nobody's seen him for three years. He said to him, It is I. Go say to your master, Behold, Elijah is here. And he said, What sin have I committed that you are giving your servant into the hand of Ahab to put me to death? As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my master has not sent to search for you. And when they said he's not here, he made the kingdom or nation swear that they could not find you. And now you're saying, go say to your master, behold, Elijah is here. It will come about that when I leave you, the spirit of the Lord will carry you to where I don't know. And then I, when I come and tell Ahab he can't find you, he'll kill me. Although I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. Has it not been told to my master what I did? When Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord, that I hid a hundred prophets of the Lord by fifties in a cave and provided them with bread and water. Now you're saying, go say to your master, behold, Elijah is here. He will kill me then. And Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, I will surely show myself to him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. This is a long conversation, but in this conversation, biblically speaking, uh, most Bible conversations are pretty short. But some details show up in this conversation. Number one, that, that we don't get from chapter 17. Number one, just how antagonistic Ahab and Jezebel have been to Yahweh worship. It wasn't just that they established Baal worship. Baal worship had been around uh, for centuries from the time that the Israelites came into the promised land. But it's been around, but this is different. Uh, Ahab built a temple to Baal in Samaria. Uh, Jezebel ordered the prophets of Yahweh killed. Not only are, there's not going to be going to be any competition for Baal worship. She is zealous for Baal. So the prophets of Yahweh, Elijah's not the only one, they've been killed except for a hundred that Obadiah has kept secret. That's the second detail that emerges. This is not the same Obadiah who wrote the book Obadiah. It's a different Obadiah. But he's the inside man. He's one of Ahab's uh, servants. He is over the household. He's his head butler of the palace. And this man, who is so close to Ahab, has been keeping prophets of Yahweh safe at the risk of his own life. He's been hiding them in a cave and feeding them with bread and water. The, chapter 17 is about how God protected Elijah. The Obadiah has been doing this for three years, has been protecting a hundred people and keeping them safe. Uh, God is providing through Obadiah for these other prophets the same way that he provided for Elijah in the wilderness and through the widow. The detail also emerges just how hard they've been looking for Elijah. Elijah said, it is not going to rain until I say so. And after who knows how long it took before it didn't rain that they said, you know what, where is Elijah? <laughs> uh, we maybe ought to find him and see if he can fix this situation. And so after who knows how long, it's been three years, and they've been looking everywhere and haven't found him. Uh, they didn't look at that widow's house, obviously. Uh, but they've been looking everywhere and making people swear. You promise you haven't seen Elijah because if you've seen Elijah and you haven't told me, uh, they're going to get him. Obadiah is sent to go tell Ahab, and Obadiah has this awesome expectation of how he thinks Elijah moves around. Nobody's been able to find him for three years, remember? So Obadiah just assumes that God just picks him up and takes him wherever he wants to go. The Spirit's just going to whisk you away, and I'm going to be left here saying, I, he was here, I swear. <laughs> and Elijah says, uh, I love Elijah's answer, I'll be here. I've been sent. I've been sent to confront Ahab. That's chapter one, the Obadiah incident. Part two, trash talking the king. Look at 1 uh, Kings 18, verses 17 through 19. It came about when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is this you, you troubler of Israel? And he said, I have not troubled Israel. You and your father's house have, because you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and you have followed the Baals. Now then send and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel, together with 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. I love this little interaction. 
I don't have much to say about it except for there seems to be a pretty significant disagreement about whose fault it is that Israel is in the trouble it's in. <laughs> Ahab says to Elijah, is this you, you troubler of Israel? Has it rained in Israel for three years because of you? And Elijah says, me? <laughs> I, think, I don't think you understand. This is your fault because you have led Israel away from Yahweh and toward Baal. Remember that? Uh, this is about you and about your father and about the way that you have led Israel away from Yahweh and toward Baal. So Elijah tells Ahab, I love that Elijah commands Ahab. Prophets, uh, this is a Hebrew word uh, or a Yiddish word, chutzpah. You know the word chutzpah? <laughs> chutzpah is spiritual audacity. Uh, and Elijah has some spiritual audacity and says, I haven't troubled Israel. You've troubled Israel. Now do what I tell you and go call Israel together on Mount Carmel. Bring all the prophets. Bring all the Baal's prophets and all the Asherah's prophets and I'll meet you there. And so they meet there. Chapter 3, setting the stage. Look at 1 Kings 18, starting in verse 20. So Ahab sent a message among all the sons of Israel and brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? Literally, uh, the word means, How long will you limp along between two opinions? If the Lord, if Yahweh, capital L-O-R-D is Yahweh, if the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left of the prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them give us two oxen. Let them choose one ox for themselves and cut it up and place it on the wood, but put no fire under it. I will prepare the other ox and lay it on the wood and will not put any fire under it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord, Yahweh, and the God who answers by fire, he's God. And all the people answered and said, that is a good idea. I love this chapter so much. Uh, so I want, if you, during this section, I want you to get the soundtrack in your head during this, this little uh, part of the story. Let's see if I can do it. I'm not always very good at this. <laughs> yeah, okay. You got it? It's a western. It's a showdown. It's the good, the bad, and the ugly. The, the tumbleweed is blowing through the top of Mount Carmel. The, the setup has been, has been uh, done. So Elijah, for the, the longest time, has been uh, incognito. He's been out of the picture for three years. And when he shows up and he has a crowd, he can't resist and he starts to preach. Uh, how long will you limp along between two opinions? I really want you to get the visual here. Uh, there's a, a, an old movie called Hook uh, that was a Steven Spielberg movie and it was about Peter Pan has grown up and he returns to Neverland. And when he returns, uh, people don't re the lost boys are still there and a lot of them don't recognize him. Some of them think he's Peter Pan. But they've started following this other leader named Rufio and there's this conflict between uh, Peter Pan and Rufio and the boy, the lost boys are trying to decide who's who. And so one of them will say something, one of them the other will say something else, and the lost boys are doing this the whole time. <laughs> That's what Elijah is saying here. How, how long are you guys going to do this? You guys have been doing this for centuries. How long are you going to limp along between, between Yahweh and Baal? How long are you going to limp along and worship the God who led you out of slavery in Egypt? And how long are you going to limp along and worship Baal just in case he's actually the fertility God and can provide you with the crops and the food that you need? How long are you guys going to do that? And what do they answer? Nothing. <laughs> you hear the crickets in the background. Cricket, cricket, cricket. Uh, the, the kingdom is divided. The tribes are divided into two, but their hearts are divided. And their hearts have been divided for a long time between the God of Israel and these other gods, particularly Baal. How long are you going to do this? Elijah says something a little weird here. He says, I alone am left. <clears throat> we just heard that there are a hundred prophets hiding in a cave. So either he is keeping a secret or he has a tendency to forget that he's not the only one. We'll see this again in the next chapter that Elijah has this tendency to forget that he's not the only one out there. But I love the priceless reaction of the people of Israel to this God contest idea. That's a good idea. <laughs> They said, well, that's a, that's a fantastic idea. We'll set up two altars uh, and we'll go. So this is my second favorite thing. In this chapter, which is one of my favorites in the whole Bible, this is my second favorite thing about uh, this chapter is that Elijah then says, you go first. <laughs> Verse 25. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose an ox for yourselves. Prepare it first, for you are many. Call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. 
The prophets of Asherah were invited too, but apparently they didn't show up. It's just the prophets of Baal. There's 450 of them. Verse 26. They took the ox which was given them, they prepared it, and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. <coughs> but there was no voice, and no one answered. And they leaped about the altar they had made. This is my favorite thing about this chapter. This is legitimately one of my favorite things in the whole Bible. <laughs> Verse 27. It came about at noon. They've been doing this for hours now. It came about at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Call out louder. <laughs> Call out with a loud voice, for he's God. Maybe he's occupied or has gone aside or is on a journey. <coughs> Maybe he's asleep and you need to wake him up. By the way, occupied uh, might mean, Hebrew scholars have disagreed on this one, might mean in the bathroom. Uh, maybe he's in the bathroom. Maybe he's gone. Maybe he went on a trip. Maybe he went on vacation. Maybe he's asleep. You guys need to yell louder. I love this. That this is legitimately one of my favorite things in the whole Bible. That surrounded by 450 prophets of Baal, Elijah thinks this is a good opportunity to trash talk the prophets of Baal. Uh, if you're familiar with, if you're not familiar with the concept of trash talk, you haven't played enough uh, <coughs> intramural sports. Uh, or, or basketball or anything like that. Uh, one of my members of our congregation in Marshall was a lady named Maxine McDonald, and she is, has passed away now. But she wrote songs, and most of her songs uh, she wrote were in the Southern Gospel kind of tradition. But I, I preached on this passage when we, we were in Marshall, and she wrote a song just called Elijah. <coughs> and it's a bouncy little tune. Uh, and she wrote uh, several verses, but I'm just going to read you a couple. Uh, she wrote, Elijah was a trash-talking prophet. He told it like it was, no matter the cost. God's people had turned away from the teaching. The worship of Baal would be their loss. No more rain, no more rain, until I give the word. Test your God and wait for fire. The God who answers, he's the one. And I just, I just love this so much that <laughs> Elijah trash-talked them and called out the fact that God was not answering. Trash talk, by the way, is only good if you can back it up. You don't get points for trash talk. <laughs> Uh, no points are given for trash talk. It only works if you have the skill to back it up. <coughs> in one sense, Elijah is outnumbered 450 to 1. There are 450 prophets of Baal dancing, and it must have been a, a tremendous noise of them yelling and dancing around this altar. So in one sense, he's outnumbered 451 if you're counting prophets. But if you're counting gods, then Elijah <laughs> is in winning because it's 1 to 0. Uh, Baal is not showing up. <coughs> it doesn't matter how loud, how loud they're going to cry. Uh, continuing on, sorry, verse 28. So they cried with a loud voice and cut themselves according to their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out on them. It came about when midday was past and they had raved until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, but there was no voice, no one answered, and no one paid attention. <coughs> I love the Bible's little details like that. Uh, stories like this and chapters like this uh, are a lot more fun when you notice those little details. Is that for me? Thank you very much. I got excited and started coughing. Uh, no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. Remember, by the way, that Baal is the god of thunder and lightning. Baal is supposed to be a warrior god. And if you are a warrior and someone starts trash talking you, your response should be <laughs> to pick a fight. All they need the, the altar is all set up. The ox is there. The fire is ready. All they need is one lousy lightning bolt. He's the god of lightning. That's all they need. And nothing. No voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. Hmm. Uh, and then, our next section here. Part five. Raising the stakes. <coughs> First Kings 18, starting in verse 30. Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. So all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. <laughs> That's a little, nice little detail there. Elijah took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Not 10 stones, 12 stones. Uh, Elijah is thinking bigger than even uh, Ahab and the divided kingdom is thinking. Verse 32. So with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two measures of seed. 
Then he arranged the wood and cut the ox in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four pitchers with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water flowed around the altar. And he also filled the trench with water. Raising the stakes. Uh, have you ever tried to light wet wood? <laughs> ever been on a camp out? Yeah. Um, think about, also remember, it has not rained for three years. And so 12 pitchers of water is a pretty precious commodity. Uh, and he has just poured this out on this offering. This, is, this was not part of the original agreement. Uh, all, all they needed to do was light a fire. And Elijah has just, just upped the difficulty level just a slight amount by drenching the oxen and the wood and everything and filling up the trench around it with water. Part six, the God who answers by fire. First Kings 18, verse 36. It came about at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I'm your servant and that I've done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord. Answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, he is God. Yahweh, he is God. Yahweh, he is God. Then Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. Elijah is the praying prophet. He's already been the preaching prophet, and now he's praying. And what does he pray? Let them know. Let them know who you are. Let them know who I am, that I am your prophet. Let them know who they are, that they are your people. They've always supposed to have been your people. Let their hearts turn to you. Let them know that their hearts belong to you. And he prays, and God fulfills his prayer uh, have you ever tried to burn a rock? <laughs> you, it takes uh, more than a lightning bolt to, more, to burn a rock. Uh, you're going to need some pretty intense heat. Uh, it burns up the sacrifice and the wood and the rocks and the dust and the water that was in the trench. Uh, it doesn't matter how much uh, you up the difficulty level, God is able to take care of that. And then, be, and then Elijah becomes Elijah the vengeance dealing prophet. Remember the prophets of Yahweh have been killed. Uh, and these 450 guys do not get off this mountain. Uh, this, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago when we talked about violence in the Old Testament versus the New Testament. Um, <clears throat> the Old Testament was a rather different time. But I want you to consider this possibility. Uh, the Bible does not say where these prophets of Baal came from. Jezebel is a priestess uh, from Sidon, from the, the kingdom of Phoenicia. And a lot of people assume that she just brought these guys over. Uh, there's 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah. And Elijah says earlier in the chapter, they eat at Jezebel's table. So they're fed by the king. They have government jobs. They have a, a cushy government salary uh, from Jezebel and from Ahab. Consider the possibility that, we don't know for sure, but consider the possibility that these were Israelites who read the lay of the land and they said, did you guys hear we're starting a new religion? <laughs> they are hiring over at the Baal temple. Uh, they are, they, there are plenty of seats available at Jezebel's table. And so they didn't limp along between two opinions. They picked a side. And the side they picked was Baal's side. The side they picked was Jezebel's side. And they lost their lives because of it. By the way, this is not the only time that Elijah calls down fire from heaven. Uh, he does it again in 2 Kings chapter 1. Ahab has had enough of him, and so he sends uh, two squads of soldiers after him. Uh, and Elijah calls down fire from heaven two times. The third squad of soldiers that Ahab sends after him, the captain of the squad goes up and says, please don't burn us with fire. Uh, we, I just, I'm just following orders. I just let us go. And Elijah lets them go. The epilogue of this little story. Verse 41. Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink. For there's the sound of the roar of a heavy shower. So Ahab went up to eat and drink. Elijah went up to the top of Carmel and he crouched down on the earth and put his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. So he went up and looked and said, there's nothing. He said, go back seven times. It came about the seventh time that he said, behold, a cloud as small as a man's hand is coming up from the sea. He said, go say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down, 
so that the heavy shower does not stop you. So it came about in a little while that the sky grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a heavy shower. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. Then the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins. He hitched up his leather pants. He girded up his loins and outran Ahab to Jezreel. The epilogue is the rainmaker. A uh, little detail here. Where does this servant come from? He just kind of appears out of nowhere in the story. I like to think that he's a new volunteer. Uh, that after the whole God contest incident, one guy raised his hand and said, can I work for you? <laughs> I, I want to be on your side. Uh, and then he's the last scene of this chapter is uh, Elijah the running prophet. This will not be the last running that Elijah does. We'll come back to chapter 19 next week and look at a little different. Uh, this is Elijah in triumph. We get a little different picture of Elijah in chapter 19. But I love this story. You can see it's, it's just beautifully put together, an incredibly dramatic story. And it has these moments of high drama and these moments of, in my opinion, high humor uh, in this dramatic story. But it's more than just a great story. <coughs> the question always is, what do we do with this today? So when I was a youth minister, I had a youth named Tyler. Uh, and he asked this great question. He said, why doesn't God do stuff like this again? Uh, why doesn't God arrange more contests and just prove uh, that he can do what he wants to do? <coughs> Excuse me. It's a great question. Uh, my first answer to that question is this is not an experiment to recreate. Uh, God is not really interested in being uh, experimented on uh, or, or tried in a scientific way. God apparently wants to be known in a relational kind of way. Uh, and so if God uh, jumps through the hoops that we set for him, then that's not a relationship. That's something quite different. What God has done here is ordained a showdown for the sake of the people of Israel. What, what is going on here, the fire is dramatic, the water is dramatic, the, the no rain is dramatic, but this is all about the hearts of the people. The hearts of the people have been turned toward Baal, and God does this so that his people's hearts turn back toward him. But this is not the thing that finally cures Israel of its idolatry problem. Israel continues to struggle with idolatry until the exile. And it's after they had lost everything that God had promised them because of their idolatry. After the exile, Israel doesn't struggle with idolatry the same way that they did up until this time. The first thing that happens after they get out of Egypt uh, and Moses disappears for a few days is they freak out and they build a god that they can have control over. They make a golden calf. And ever since then, they've struggled with idolatry. And they continue to do this even after God rained down fire from heaven. Part of the particular sin... Uh, the particular curse of sin on our lives is that miracles uh, tend not to be the end-all and be-all for us. Uh, we can see things that are miraculous and still not be convinced. We can see things that are miraculous and still wander away. Uh, we are, are hard to impress, apparently, as people, uh, that, that miracles are not the end-all and be-all. And So that's one reason why God does not continue to do this, is because miracles don't have the sustaining faith uh, gathering power that you would hope that they would. In some cases, they do. We talked about last week that miracles in the Bible tend to cluster around times in which God is doing something specific in history. And in this case, it's Elijah challenging the power of Ahab and Jezebel. But miracles, biblically speaking, are not the end all and be all for faith. And if we're talking about miracles, God's already done something better than this. God raised Jesus from the dead, never to die again. What more do you need? <laughs> what more do you want than the testimony that Jesus Christ, who was crucified, is now alive? And that people gave their lives, the original disciples who testified that they saw Jesus alive, gave their lives rather than uh, say that they were lying about that. What more do you need than the testimony that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead? Uh, we have a God who has no rival and no equals, and he's already proved it. Uh, if you win the Super Bowl, they don't make you play another game just to make sure that you win it again. Uh, he's already won. He's already achieved the victory over sin and evil and death. He still continues to do miracles in our world, but uh, only those who have uh, ears to see. You, you all know people who can see really obvious things and not see them, right? <clears throat> there are still, I, I have a friend who, um, he experiments with uh, weather balloons. And so he attaches uh, cameras to like, the super high weather balloons that go out into the lower atmosphere or the upper atmosphere. And every time that he posts a video, of his weather balloons going up and, and scanning the atmosphere horizon. He, he posts them on YouTube, and every single time he does that, he gets people commenting on YouTube saying, see, you can't see the curvature of the Earth. The Earth is flat. Guys, there are still people who believe the Earth is flat. 
uh, people will believe whatever they want to believe. You can prove it to them as often as you want, but unless they want to, they won't see it. And so that's one reason why God doesn't do this over and over again is because I don't think it would work quite as well as we think it would. But here's the other thing. Uh, this is not just something that happened. This is not just something that happened in the past. This is something that is happening. Uh, we are in a God contest. Uh, we could sing, our God is an awesome God, and say, God has no rival and no equal, and go home. But there's a deeper question that remains. Uh, we are in a showdown in, in our culture. You are in a showdown in your life, a God contest. Uh, here's a, a, a tricky question to ask. Are you limping along between two opinions? Are you shuffling back and forth about who your Lord is in your life? Is it Jesus, the one who was raised from the dead, or is it you? Uh, who's in charge of your life? Is it Jesus or is it something else? Is it Jesus? Is it money? Is it power? Is it your fame? What is Lord of your life? What has authority over you and what controls you? For these guys, it was Baal and Yahweh. Baal is the lightning god. If he can start a fire, let him do it. And so the contest is appropriate to the question, who's Lord in your life? Is it Baal or is it Yahweh? The contest answers the question. What about in your life? Do you need a miracle to decide between who's in charge of your life, Jesus or you? Or do you need something else? If you've picked a side, if, you're, if you've been limping along between two opinions, then the question is, how long are you going to limp along between two opinions? If you are the Lord of your life, if you are the one who can give you what you need in your life, the freedom and the salvation, uh, the family and the love, then good luck to you. But if you can't do that in your life, if you are not capable of giving yourself the freedom if you are not capable of bringing in yourself salvation, if you are not capable of bringing in yourself a family that uh, reaches out across the boundaries and make peace and make reconciliation, then you need to look for another Lord. And the Lord that the Bible points us to is Christ, who died to give us freedom and who died to give us salvation and who died to make peace and make reconciliation, and make one family of faith uh, out of people who were divided. So if you can't do that yourself, then I recommend Jesus to you <laughs> because he is the Lord who came to do just that. If you've picked a side, if you know that you are not limping along between two opinions, if you've picked a side and you've confessed Jesus is Lord of your life, then you're still in a God contest. The question is, how are you fighting? There's this fantastic story in Luke chapter 9, and uh, we didn't put it on the slide there because I didn't think of it until late in the game, uh, but it's Luke chapter 9, verse 51 through 56. <clears throat> it says in Luke chapter 9, 51, it came about when the days were approaching for Jesus' ascension, that he resolutely set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead of him. And they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. And they did not receive him because he was journeying with his face toward Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? And he turned and rebuked them. Some later manuscripts of the Bible say, and he said, you do not know what kind of spirit you are of. The Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. James and John, you may remember, were called the Sons of Thunder. It's probably because of things like this. <coughs> you got a village that doesn't want to receive Jesus. Do you want us to call fire down from heaven and consume them? And I don't know if you uh, imagine Jesus this way, but I imagine that Jesus, as he spent time with his disciples, did a lot of this. And I imagine he did a lot of this. And he said, no, no, I don't want you to call fire down from heaven and consume them. Uh, no, thank you for the offer, but no. Well, you don't know what kind of spirit you're of. That's not what I came for. I didn't come to destroy. I came to save. So if we have picked a side, if we are on God's side, if we are on Jesus' side, how do we fight our battles? Elijah called down fire from heaven. Elijah slew the prophets of Baal. We're called to do something different, and frankly, called to do something a little more challenging. Trash talk is pretty satisfying, uh, but you have to have the, the skill to back it up. It, as we are in a showdown between our God and the forces in the world that are opposed to God, have we become content with trash talk? Uh, have we become content with putting down those who don't believe what we believe? Have we become content do we, do we think we've won when we've trash-talked our opponents? Or do we really want to be dealers of vengeance? And that's what we secretly hope for, is the opportunity to deal out vengeance on those that we disagree with. Have we left out what Elijah also included, uh, which is the preaching and the prayer 
and the obedience? <coughs> because what's at stake is the same thing that was at stake here in 1 Kings 18. What's at stake is the hearts of the people. What's at stake is the people who are limping along between two opinions. Did you know, I read about this the other day, did you know that people in America, uh, even non-religious people, tend to be more religious than, uh, say, people in Europe? Uh, there's, uh, there was a survey. Some, some Christians in Europe pray less often than people in, the, than in America who say they are not religious. <laughs> there's something in our culture that tells us that we're supposed to reach out. And yet, you can tell, just looking at our culture, that there's a limping along between two opinions. Have we, could be, have we become satisfied with trash talk? Do we want to call down fire from heaven? Uh, or, or have we left out the preaching and the prayer and the obedience? I think our biggest challenge uh, in Christianity today is not between Yahweh, the God of Israel, and some other God, but it's between God as he calls us to be and the watered down false God that we make in our image. We do the same thing that the people of Israel did back in the day, and we craft a God that does what we want him to. We craft a God that makes us comfortable instead of this God that challenges us to love our enemies. <coughs> For some people, it's the patriotic American God. Uh, Wednesday was the 4th of July, and I love the 4th of July. Uh, but there's something that we have to be very careful about uh, when we talk about God and the United States, or God in any country. Uh, in this room, there are many symbols. There are many symbols. Uh, the biggest one, the most important one, is the one that's directly behind me, the one that's on our, on our windows. It's the symbol of the cross. There is one symbol in this room that will not be in the kingdom of God, and it's the one that's back in the corner over there. It's the American flag. There will not be an American flag flying in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, we have an allegiance that, that supersedes an allegiance to any nation. And so it's one thing to say to thank God. Thank you, God that we live in a country in which we can worship freely because there are many Christians around the world who cannot. There are many Christians who are meeting today in places in secret, in places literally underground so that they can worship the way that God calls them to. We don't have to do that. We thank God for that. But our religion is not America. Our religion is the worship of Jesus Christ. So we need to be careful about that. Our, our <laughs> God is not patriotic toward America. Let's, let's just say it that way. It sounds ridiculous to say it that way, but if you listen closely, it kind of sounds like people mean it that way sometimes. And it's not, that is not the case. God's, uh, God's allegiance is to the kingdom of God. <laughs> and our allegiance, if we follow God, is to the kingdom of God. I love America and I'm grateful for uh, all the good that God has done in it and through it. But my allegiance is to the kingdom of God. The question is, so that, that's one version of, a, of a, a convenient God that we worship is the patriotic American God, but there's all kinds of versions. Whichever God is most convenient for you, that's what we tend to craft. Which God do we serve? The one who challenges us and calls us to obedience or the one who confirms our opinions? The God who hates all the same people that we hate. Uh, the God that votes for the same people. If God could vote, the God that would vote for all the same people that we vote for. Uh, or do we follow the God who calls us to love our enemies? And the God who demonstrated what that looks like in Jesus Christ through self-sacrificial love. Here's the truth. It is easier to trash talk than to take up your cross and follow. It is easier to call down fire from heaven than it is to take up your cross and follow. Um, <clears throat> our youth went to youth camp last week. And they uh, will show a video here in a second. And you'll hear some testimony about them. And I have a word to say to our youth. I remember as a youth wishing that uh, more of my life was like youth camp uh, because youth camp is awesome. And I, I remember being down on myself uh, when a couple of weeks after youth camp, I did not feel the same way that I felt at youth camp. And it was not until I was much older that I realized at youth camp, you go to worship twice a day. <laughs> at youth camp, you are surrounded by people who all the people who are there, from the people who serve you food to the people who are on the ropes course to the people who are leading worship, the entire reason that they are there is to help you know God better. And then you enter into a world in which that is not the case. And so no wonder it feels different at youth camp than it does everywhere else. It is easier. Uh, it, it, that's a mountaintop experience. That's something that feeds into you so that you can go out into the world and give that into a world that does not acknowledge the lordship of Jesus Christ. So don't expect it to feel the same. But expect that God will be with you in the same way that he was with you in those mountaintop experiences. He will be with you in the valley. It's easier to trash talk than to take up your cross. It's easier to call down fire from heaven than to take up your cross. But the hearts of the people who do not know God are at stake. 
And the fire that God wants to bring in our lives is not fire to come down from heaven and consume our enemies. It's the fire to show people, uh, to show to a divided people what a life on fire for God looks like. If you want fire in your life, ask for it in your heart so that people can tell by the way that you live that, you, that you don't have, you're not limping along. You've chosen. You are following God. We are living in a showdown. We are in a God contest. And our calendars and what we do with our time and our checkbooks and what we do with our money, our Facebook pages and our Twitter feeds and our mouths and our loves and our hatreds show whether we are limping along between two opinions or whether our lives declare the Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for this day. Thank You, Lord, for the way that You love us. And thank You, God, for the challenge of this word. God, that You don't want us to limp along, that You want us to wholeheartedly to fall on our faces and say, the Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. You've called us to a challenging task, God, to live that out in our lives, to show people by our lives and our actions, to show people, God, who are limping along between two opinions what it looks like to have chosen Jesus as Lord. And we ask that you would give us the strength and the passion and the fire to do that. Heavenly Father, I pray for any here uh, listening today, God, who, who feel that struggle. They feel their heart divided, their, their soul divided between wanting to believe and wanting not to, between wanting to follow and wanting to, to be their own God. And I pray, God, that your spirit would call to them and your spirit would show them the freedom that is found in Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for your love for us and for loving us enough to challenge us. We love you, Lord, and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.